Have you got your Bibles today? Do you have your Bibles? I hope you do. I'm going to ask you to turn back with me to John. And we're going to head to John chapter 14. John chapter 14. We finished up chapter 13. We're now moving forward into chapter 14. Maybe as we finish, um, or as we, as we get ready to begin, we can finish chapter 13 um, just by way of reminder for us. Remember that um, Judas has just now gone out to betray the Lord. And he went out, and it was night because Satan had entered into him. And after he went out, Jesus spoke to the, uh, the 11 others, uh, the, the, the other 11 disciples. And this is a solemn moment. And they, I think they have an idea of what's going on, but they obviously don't really recognize the cross. Jesus has not uh, specifically said it. He has alluded to it when he speaks of being lifted up and such. Um, but he's not said it specifically. But he said that one of you will betray me. And let's just pick up in chapter 13 with verse 36, uh, because this will, I think, carry into our our discussion today. So John 13, beginning in verse 36, Simon Peter said to him, Lord, where are you going? Jesus answered, where I go, you cannot follow me now, but you will follow me later. Peter said to him, Lord, why can I not follow you right now? I will lay down my life for you. Jesus answered, will you lay down your life for me? Truly, truly, I say to you, a rooster will not crow until you deny me three times. I mean, literally before the next morning comes, Peter, for all, all of your bravado, you're actually going to deny me three times before the rooster crows, signifying that the dawn has come. Pretty strong words. They know that Jesus is going to his death because Peter even says, I'll go with you. But they still don't understand so much about the Messiah. They don't understand. They, they believe that he's the Messiah. I think they are beginning to understand and they recognize that he says that he is not only the Messiah, but he is God Almighty. And Jesus now wants to comfort them and encourage them because it's pretty solemn words to say to someone, hey, within the next 12 or so hours, you're going <coughs> to deny me three times. I mean, that would be a bad way to say, and amen, let's go. That would be kind of a depressing way to end everything, wouldn't it? So Jesus is going to move on and he's going to share something else with them. Verse 1 of chapter 14, and we will read through the first 14 verses. Jesus says, Do not let your heart be troubled. Believe in God and believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions or dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you, for I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And you know the way where I am going. And Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you're going. How do we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. From now on, you know him and have seen him. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father, and it will be enough for us. Jesus said to him, Have I not been so long with you, and yet you've not come to know me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, Show me the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak of my own initiative, but the Father abiding in me does his works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. Otherwise, believe because of the works themselves. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also. And greater works than these he will do because I go to the Father. Whatever you ask in my name, that I will do so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will. We'll do it. Wow. Wow. Can you imagine had you been there that evening to hear those words? You might say, I wish I had been there to hear them. Guess what? 
the words are still as powerful today. They are still as applicable today. And with the Lord's help this morning, I want to speak to you about Jesus's personal message for you. Jesus's personal message for you. And he actually, I believe, gives us at least four encouraging messages and words in this portion of scripture today. And they were not only just for the disciples, but they carry down through the centuries to every child of God, every believer. These words are true. And so today I'm trusting with God's help that you will receive Jesus's personal message for you as a follower of Christ. And with that said, let's pray. Heavenly Father, I ask today, Lord, we need you. We, Lord, I can do nothing without you. I am nothing, Lord. Just you're the one that would deliver the message today. I pray your, your word is already anointed, but I pray, would you minister to me? Help me to bring forth your word to rightly divide your word of truth. And I pray for every one of us here, myself included, that you would give us ears that would be open and that would really receive what you would say to us because this is your word for your people today, each and every one of us. Help us to receive and to understand, to recognize the tremendous blessings and truths of the messages conveyed here. We love you, we thank you, and I'm just believing you for a wonderful time in your word. I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. amen. And amen. So we begin in these first four verses. Jesus says, do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. And I've got to stop right there. Don't let your heart be troubled. Do you remember in chapter 13, just one chapter before, as Jesus was preparing to uh, partake uh, with the disciples, that his heart was troubled, his spirit was troubled. Well, now here he says to the disciples, I don't want your hearts to be troubled. And, and that word in the original language is terasso, and it means to become, to become or to be characterized, listen now, by distress, affliction, danger, or an intense feeling of need. When someone is troubled, it means that they are, their, their, their being, who they are, is characterized either by some type of affliction, by some type of distress, by some type potentially of danger, or just a feeling of need. You're agitated is what it really means in the original language. So Jesus says, I don't want you to allow your hearts to become agitated based on what I've just told you and what is coming soon. Can I just share with you right now? It would be so easy and it is easy for us as believers to have our hearts troubled. I imagine for many of us, not a week goes by. For some of us, maybe not a day goes by, but what our hearts are troubled. It may be by our circumstances, maybe by just the state of the world. You for sure will have your heart troubled if you watch the news too long. I guarantee you that, no doubt about it. It may be just something going on in your own life. Maybe it's a personal difficulty. Maybe it's a besetting sin. The Bible talks about these sins that seem to can sometimes lay hold of us. And some people pray for weeks and months and sometimes years. Some people decades there. Something is held on to them and they're troubled in their heart. They know they want to be free. I don't know what's troubling you today, but I would imagine that most, if not all of us here, would say from time to time, our hearts are troubled. We should take encouragement in the fact that Jesus says, let not your hearts be troubled. And then he tells us why they don't need to be troubled today. Because he says, you believe in God, I want you to also believe in me. He is speaking to people that already believe in a father in heaven, the Jews understood God was their father. They believed in God. They believed in Yahweh, Jehovah. They understood him to be true. But Jesus' point was to get across to them that I and the father are one. So if you believe in God, the father, believe also in me. And then he gives us this incredible declaration, one of the most wonderful promises and hopes and truths in all of the scripture. I use it often 
when we are doing memorial services for those that have passed away and gone on to be with Jesus. But it's also a word and a truth for you and I today. And so this is the beginning of what we want to understand in terms of Jesus' personal message to us. Our hearts don't need to be troubled. We believe in God. We believe in Jesus because he is God. And then look at the incredible promise that he gives to us. He says, in my father's house are many mansions, and it's not really mansions in the Greek. I'm not sure uh, why the King James said mansions. It sounds great. I know many of us, I don't mean to burst your bubble, but really it's rooms because if you look at the eventual promise of God for a new heavens and a new earth, there's a city called the New Jerusalem. Amen? And we will all have a dwelling place in that city. And Jesus says, I'm going to prepare a place for you. And he wants them all to know there's plenty of room, plenty of space for each and every one. I, you know, I'm so thankful. Um, my heart breaks for Jehovah's Witnesses because they are caught in a lie and they believe a falsehood about Jesus. It is a cult. It is not a Christian denomination or belief system. And one of their beliefs is that only 144,000 people get to go to heaven. I guess in their mind, oh, there's only room for so many. And the rest of the people have to stay on the earth. But you know what? Jesus says, in my Father's house are many dwelling places. And the gist there is, there is room enough for each and every one that comes to faith in Jesus Christ. Hallelujah! I'm so glad. Never does the sign go on, no vacancy. Sorry, we just filled up the last one. No, nope, sorry, 1995, that was the end point. We can't have any more. No, on and on and on it goes. In my father's house, there are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you. And then he says this, I go to prepare a place for you. Jesus is up there right now. I love what Keith Green said. He said, you know, if, the, if it took the Lord, if it took God six days to make the heavens and the earth and everything that we see all around us, and Jesus has been up in heaven about 2,000 years pre pre preparing a place for us, can you imagine how awesome that place is going to be? Wow! Jesus says, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare that place for you, this is so important, I will come again. And I will receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Jesus is preparing a place for us. And then he offers this great promise, I'll come again. Because you see, it's in the Father's house. That means it's in heaven, amen? The disciples would understand this. Psalm 33, 13, and 14, the Lord looks from heaven. He sees all the sons of men. From his dwelling place, he looks out on all the inhabitants of the earth. I get jealous sometimes when I see these pictures of people that own homes that are up in the mountains. I love the Blue Ridge Mountains. That's kind of my, my heartbeat and where my family comes from. Every once in a while, I'll look out and someone will show a picture and they'll say, my morning, this is how I started my devotions. And they're up on the, the their house is on the mountaintop and you see this Boom, this big, beautiful, glorious picture of a valley below and other mountains in the distance and the deer are, are by the water brooks and then the, all the animals are just, yeah, and it's so wonderful. And then I'm like, I get up and I look out and uh, never mind. It's, it's not quite the same. But God dwells in heaven. God dwells in heaven and he looks down upon the earth. He sees everything, all of the beauty that he has created, all of the universe, everything. We're told in Isaiah 63, 15, Lord, you look down from heaven. Look from your holy, glorious home and see us. Look from your glorious, holy home and see us. God's dwelling is in heaven. And Jesus says, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go, I'll come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. That's good news because, you see, I can't reach up to heaven. I can't get up there. There's some people in the Old Testament that tried that, built a big tower, Tower of Babel. Didn't work. You can't get up to heaven by man's ways. So Jesus says, I'm going to prepare that place for you, and they're going to see him ascend eventually. Spoiler alert, if you don't know the end of the story, Jesus will die on the cross, he'll be raised from the dead, and he will literally, physically go back up into heaven. And he's saying, you guys are going to see all this, I'm going to go and prepare a place for you, but I will come back for you. 
I am so thankful. This has been the hope of the early church and it is our hope again today, just as surely as Jesus went up into heaven, he will return to take his followers to the place that he has prepared for them. This, folks, this is the New Testament hope of every Christian. And it's not only the New Testament Christians, it's our hope today, amen? Yeah, folks, this is the answer. Please, the answer is not, oh, if, this, if these people will get in charge and these people will do this, we'll begin to make everything right and we'll get peace over here and everything will be great. Oh, please, these people have no clue what they're doing. Please. We, my hope is not in man at all. See, I, see, you say, well, how do you know? Because I got the book. And the book tells me it's going to get worse and worse and worse and worse. The only hope is Jesus. And Jesus has gone to prepare a place for us, and he will come again. And that's what you and I need now more than ever is that hope of the glorious return of Jesus Christ. Hope for the future. Because a future on our own without God in control, it just never goes well. It goes sideways every single time. The best laid plans, and they go sideways. I want to share with you three things about this return of the Lord that I think are important. Number one is this, the ultimate purpose of the Lord's return is that his faithful people will be with him forever. That's the point. I'm going to prepare a place for you and I'm going to come back for you so that you and I will be together forever. Amen? Isn't that wonderful? That's fantastic. Number two, the words I will take you to be with me refer, I believe this now with all my heart, refer to the rapture of the church more so than death. Although, in a sense, when people die, they go to be with the Lord. He's, I think, speaking of the collective that he will one day come back. And Paul talks about this in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. I'm not going to get off into this too much, but you can read this on your own. That one day the Lord will come back from heaven and he will gather those that have died in Christ and he will give them a resurrection body and those of us that are alive and remain and we will all meet up together in the air and so shall we ever be with the Lord. We call this the catching up or the Latin of that goes to rapture and then in English we use the, we use the word rapture, rapture and we say rapture but it just means the catching away which the Apostle Paul talks about in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. I think there's, a, uh, there's an allusion to it as well in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 that all of us will be changed one day. Amen. This mortal will put on immortality. And so when Jesus says, I will come back for you, I think a big part of this is he is saying, I will come back and I will take my people to go and be with me. Amen. This is a real hope. People that do not have a hope of the physical return of Jesus Christ for his own, they, they're, they're denying the Bible. In fact, do you remember when Jesus in, in Acts chapter 1 when he began to ascend back up to heaven and the disciples were all standing there and they're just looking up. I mean, literally, literally, physically, he's going up. This is not a ghost. This is a person with a physical resurrection body. They have seen him. They have touched him. They have eaten with him. And he's going back up to heaven. And do you remember what happened after that? Suddenly, as they're up there gazing, looking up into heaven, they're just awestruck. And we would be too. Don't act like you would be, ah, oh, yeah, okay, no big deal. No, we would all be, all of a sudden there's these angels that are there beside them. And the angels say, why are you guys just, are you just going to stay here forever looking up? This same Jesus that you have seen go up into heaven will come back in like manner as he left. And Jesus made it very clear that he would be coming back on the clouds of glory. And so the Lord's physical return is, I believe, what he's alluding to here in John 14. We don't have to have our hearts be troubled because he says, I'm going to prepare a place for you and I will come again. We will be caught up together with him in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. And then the third thing about this is the expectation of this glorious and eternal reunion should be a comfort to all who desire to be with the Lord forever, because that last verse in 1 Thessalonians 4 says this, therefore comfort or encourage one another with these words. We should always be encouraging one another with that phraseology, Maranatha, which means our Lord come. It should be the heartbeat of the church. But the church has, has somehow gone sideways and gotten, gotten away from this glorious truth that Jesus is coming back one day. And we just think we're just going to be here and I'm just going to drudge along and I'm going to try and change this and we'll see what we can do here and there and the other and then I'll eventually die. And I, and I, but the hope of the early church is that Jesus would come back 
in their lifetime. That's how I read the New Testament. So I am believing God. He could come. I, I believe the Lord could come back today. I believe that with all of my heart. And it should be our hope that he is coming back for us. Amen. That should be our hope. And I, I hope it is. So message number one, real quickly, the, the first personal message for you is Jesus says, I am coming back for you. Hallelujah. Oh, Lord, is this getting through? Every person here who is a believer, that should bring a smile to your face or a hallelujah or a thanksgiving or something that Jesus is coming back for you that I cannot give you better news. Come on now. Oh, well, if you had told me I just won Publishers Clearinghouse, then I would have jumped up and run around a Jericho march. No, no, no. This is better news than that. This is Jesus' personal message, his personal guarantee to his people. I will come again for you. And I say, hallelujah, amen. Let it be, Lord Jesus. There's nothing greater, amen? amen. I'm not putting, I'm not faking, I'm not being fake here. This is how I really feel. I'm, I'm excited about the return of Jesus Christ. I'm excited to see the signs of the times and the things that are going on all around us that just remind me, yeah, Lord, I'm, I, you're, you're coming. You're going to get it. You're going to set it all straight. And I'm so glad for that. Amen. Amen. So that's it. That's the first message is he says, I am coming again for you. OK, we're going to go on now. So Thomas then says to him, Lord, we don't know where you're going. How are we going to know the way? If we don't know where you're going, how are we going to know the way to get there? And Jesus then makes that incredible statement. I am the way, the truth and the life. No one comes to the father but through me. So we see here that the disciples once again say that they don't know the way, but they fail to realize that Jesus himself is the way. And that's what he's going to have to get through to them. And so Thomas, he's still here in his ignorance, and so he balks when Jesus talks about in verse 4, you know the way where I'm going. Thomas balks, Lord, we don't know where you're going. There's, there's no, so how can we know the way that you're He's filled with doubts. He's filled with questions. Um, and, and, and this happens throughout John. Thomas kind of gets a bad rap. We, we heard from him in chapter 11. We'll hear from him again in chapter 20. And we get this thing about Thomas and kind of doubting Thomas and all that stuff. But, but in his doubts, I think he speaks for all of us. And if, if you and I were there uh, at that Last Supper meeting, I think you and I would have had the same questions and the same concerns and doubts that he had. And of course, what's the problem? We see this throughout the Gospel of John, is that Thomas and the others are thinking on an earthly plane, and they're unaware that Jesus is speaking about heavenly realities. And so they, like the authorities earlier in the Gospel of John, when Jesus talked about, I'm going to go to another place, they too are wondering, well, where are you moving to? Where, where, where are you heading to? If you, are you going to be in Bethany again? Are you going to be outside? Are you going to go to Samaria? Where are you going to go? They don't get it. And that's why Jesus has to make the statement that he does. But this is not the first time Jesus has talked about this. In John 6, 62, he said to them, what if you see the Son of Man ascending to where he was before? So Jesus has already said to them at one point in time, you know, I'm going to ascend and head back to heaven, but they just, their minds are on earthly things, so they don't get it. So Jesus makes this great statement in verse 6, a, a, a verse that many of us have memorized, right? We know it well, don't we? Maybe you can read it out with me. Jesus said what? I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. That's what Jesus says there. He responds with the sixth of seven I am declarations. Again, I am the name of God. Jesus says, I am. And he caps off his teaching on salvation in this sixth verse, which is one of the greatest verses throughout the Bible. He says what? First, I am the way. And that describes the very heart of early Christian consciousness. It's the core of Isaiah 40 and verse 3. It opens up Mark's gospel in Mark chapter 1, verses 2 and 3. Prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight paths for him. I'm reminded that the first title of the Christian movement in the early parts of the book of Acts was they were what? A part of the way. You and I are a part of the way because we follow Jesus who is the way. Amen. Remember earlier in John, he also said, I'm the door. So I'm the one that opens. Jesus is the way to heaven. He is the way to relationship with God. And then he says this, as the way, he is also the truth and he is the life. 
See, he's the truth because he's the living revealer. He, Jesus is the very voice and revelation of God the Father. When he came to this earth, he said, I'm embodying who God is. I'm showing it to you in the most literal way that I can. He, he literally, his physical body embodied the Shekinah glory of God on the Mount of Transfiguration. Jesus was turned inside out and he's shown with this glory. Remember in the Old Testament, Moses wanted to see God. And remember what God said, well, you can't see me face to face. No man can see God face to face. And there, in our human form, we would just disintegrate because of his glory. And so all that, all that Moses could get was the backside of God. God put him in a rock and walked by, and then he released his hand, and Moses could see just the backside, the tailing off of the glory of God, always moving away from because you can't see the fullness of the glory of God. But Jesus, when he was on this earth, he literally was the embodied Shekinah glory of God. He is the one that is revealed as grace and truth, all the way back in John chapter 1 and verse 14. His words and his, and his deeds are the words and deeds of the Father. We read that in John 5 and again in John 8. And all truth is summed up in Jesus Christ. He is the resurrection and the life. John chapter 11 tells us, because God has granted him life-giving power and he bestows life on whoever he desires to. All of this is found in John's gospel. Eternal life only comes to those who believe in him. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him would not perish but have eternal, everlasting life. Amen? It's who Jesus is. So Jesus is the way to God because he is both the truth teller and truth itself. He is the life giver and he is life itself. This is who Jesus is. I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. And then John sums it up like this in his smaller letter in 1 John chapter 5 and verse 20 toward the back of your Bible. Where we read this. We know that the Son of God has come and he has given us understanding so that we can know the true God. And now we live in fellowship with the true God because we live in fellowship with his son, Jesus Christ. He is the only true God. He is eternal life. This is who Jesus is. And for this reason, the only way we can come to God, the Father, is through Jesus Christ. In our world today, we've got people that get highly offended over everything. Everyone gets offended. Everyone's upset. Now I've got to go and I've got to make my video telling everybody why I'm upset. I'm going to post this on TikTok and tell everybody why I'm upset. I'm going to get 100 people are going to watch this and they're going to know I'm upset. Or 10,000 people or whatever. Everybody gets offended. And everybody, the, the world views Christianity as oppressive. Why? Because it dares to claim that Jesus alone is the way to heaven. But we're not making the claim. Jesus is making the claim. If you're going to argue with anyone, then you're going to argue with Jesus. He's the one that made the claim. You want to call him a liar? Go right ahead. I'm not about to do it because I know he's not a liar. He is the truth. Amen. Jesus is the way. But we live in this inclusive society that wants to hear that we can live any way we want to. And each one of us can find our way to God. Well, that's the way you believe. That's fine for you. I'll have my own truth. I love it when people talk about that. That's truth for you. That's not truth for me. It's the silliest, goofiest thing. Because truth is truth. It's either real or it's not real. And if it's not real, it's not truth. Well, I know that you believe that if you go out and you lay down in the road and a semi-truck goes over top of you, you'll get squished. But that's not truth for me. Oh, really? Okay. Show me how it's not truth. Go out and lay down in the road. I don't want you to do that now, don't I? But see, this is how silly it gets. This is how, this is how dumb it gets. Jesus is the way and he is the truth. We need to understand that. But the thought that Jesus is the only way makes some people think that Christianity is now a hate religion. It's not a hate religion. It's the most loving thing in the world. In fact, here's my question to you. Think about this. Why would God go to so much trouble and pain as to send his son to earth to die on a cross if it didn't matter how people could get to heaven? If it didn't matter, what is Jesus dying on the cross for? If there are other ways in, why does he have to die on a cross Folks, it makes no sense at all. 
But the truth is that modern people have spent their entire lives rationalizing their sins, failing to realize that you cannot enter into heaven when you have that burden of sin upon you that you cannot get rid of on your own. It is an impossibility. How do you find forgiveness of sins when you're the one that's sinning? You can't do it. Someone else has to do it for you. That's why Jesus came. He is the truth that comes and dies on our behalf, and we can only be forgiven and cleansed as we believe in him, the one pure Lamb of God who came to take away the sin of the world. There's no other way, and this is the bottom line. The truth is there is no other way because there can be no other way. Jesus is the only way because there can be no other way to deal with sin. We cannot answer the bell for ourselves. We cannot pay the debt ourselves. It is an impossibility. So Jesus is the only way. So that second message that Jesus gives to us, that personal message to us is, I am the way. You've all heard it. Every one of you here are now accountable. I'm accountable. Jesus says, I am the way. It's his message to you and to me. Lord, thank you for sharing it. Thank you for telling me. Aren't you glad when people tell you the truth? The truth sets free. Amen. I want to hear the truth. Don't be telling me something that, you know, all oh, people, oh, pastor, you're looking so good today. Oh, pastor, I can tell you've lost all this weight. Nah. Sometimes you see me, oh, huh? okay, okay. If I'm losing weight, great, tell me. But, don't, but don't, be, don't be blowing smoke to me now. I want to hear the truth. I'm going to the doctor this week. I promise you the doctor is going to tell me the truth, man. The doctor is not going to, boy, you're looking fantastic. Boy, I can, he, and, and he may say you've lost some weight, but you've got to lose a lot more. And I'm, yeah, you're right, you're right. So Jesus is the truth teller. We need people that will tell us the truth. Jesus will tell us the truth. And then if you have good Christian friends, good Christian friends will tell you the truth, not just tell you what you want to hear. Jesus says, I'm telling you the truth. I am the only way. Okay, let's see if I can move on here. Verse 7, if you had known me, you would have known my father also. From now on, you know him and you have seen him. And then Philip says, Lord, show us the father. And it's enough for us. Interesting. Philip then says, I want this spectacular display. Jesus, show us the Father, and then we'll believe. Some people want big, spectacular displays. I mean, come on, Philip. You know that Moses could only see the backside of God, and he was like way up there, friend of God. I mean, delivered the whole nation of Israel, called of God, all this great stuff. And now Philip says, Lord, just show us the Father. Give us some display. There's some people that can never get beyond the physical displays that they want. Well, I'll believe if I see a miracle. Well, I'll believe if I see something spectacular take place. And unfortunately, as human beings, people get caught up in that kind of stuff. And then they fall for all kinds of fake signs and wonders that, frankly, not even a, a, a good magician could do better. People, some of these people are just pathetic in their way of trying to coerce people with fake stuff. I saw one lady one time years ago, and this is when the gold dust phenomenon was going on. And, um, you know, for any of you that were poor, it would have been a good thing to be in those meetings and be the person that cleans up afterwards. Get some of that stuff and then send it in, right? Take it into the pawn shop or something. But this is when this was going on, and this one lady, we were told to watch this video, and this lady comes up to this church. This is somewhere up north, and... Uh, the, the, the pastor there said, oh, I think the gold dust is here. And this lady was sitting, and she was the evangelist. She gets up. She comes up. She's got her hair plastered, really, like moosed up to the extreme. And she, she walks up and bends her head down and kind of does this. And you can tell she's moosed her hair in such a way that she's created a little crevice. And she does this. And, you know, you would think it was dandruff, except it was gold. But it was, it was just like a glitter. Oh, look, how wonderful. And it's like, come on. Are, are you being serious? There are people that they will believe nothing unless they see the spectacular display. And I want you to see how Jesus responds because it's really important. The disciples here are missing the point. Human beings, we long for these sensational experiences, and we think that that'll produce the trust and the allegiance, but that's not usually God's method. 
And they're, they're, the disciples are not understanding that it was God in Christ reconciling the world to himself that they were experiencing each moment of every day as they were there with Jesus. I'll quickly say this, and then we'll get to Jesus' response to Philip. But Jesus, uh, uh, let me get to this. God does perform miracles. Don't walk out of here and think we don't believe that. Of course God does. He heals today. He does sometimes manifest himself in spectacular ways. But his usual method is not detectable by human eyes. God does not usually go around and work in that way with natural eyes and ears. Philip had been looking for a sensational manifestation as evidence of the Father, but Jesus had been God's very presence among them. Right there with them, how easy it is for you and I to miss the presence of God because we're looking for something big and spectacular when God is saying, no, I'm right here. I'm right here in this place, working through my word. God, reveal your glory through the preaching of your word. This is how God operates primarily today. So don't fall into the trap. And then Jesus makes this incredible statement. Verse 9, Jesus said to Philip, Have I been so long with you, and yet you have not come to know me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. So the third beautiful message that Jesus gives here, this personal message to you and I, is very simple. Look to me if you want to see God the Father. No other way. It's through Jesus. People are looking to get to God in other ways. Well, Jesus is one of many ways. No, Jesus is the only way because he and the Father are one. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Jesus is God, and he's telling Philip and the others, you guys want to see the Father? Do you not understand? You've been with me. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Because I and the Father are one. I don't do anything of my own initiative. I don't speak what I speak just because I think it sounds good. I only say what the Father wants me to say. I only do what the Father wants me to do. By the way, what an incredible, incredible um, example the Lord has set for us. What, can, can you imagine even just going through one day and at the end of the day looking back and saying, I only did what God asked me to do. I only said what God wanted me to say. Some of us, if we went we, an, an hour later, we'd back up, oh, blew that. <laughs> what? I mean, Jesus, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. I and the Father are one. Amen. Verse 10, do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father's in me? Wow. I don't, the words I speak are not of my own initiative. I speak only that which the Father asked me to do. Verse 11, believe in me that I am in the Father and the Father in me. And then otherwise, at least believe in me because you've seen the works that I've done. I've raised people from the dead. You know all that. But you should believe that the Father's with me, that we're working in conjunction together. So Jesus says, look to me if you want to see God. If you want to know God, it must be in and through Jesus Christ. All right, we're going to quickly, we're going to wrap this up. So in verses 8 through 11, Jesus is making this statement to Philip. Uh, Philip makes a statement to him. He comes back with what he's saying. And I'm just going to say a couple of things. I'm going to sum this up real quick here. Number one, the Father has no separate manifestation from the Son. Jesus is saying that here. The Son is, on, is the only manifestation and revelation of the Father. Jesus is saying that in this portion of Scripture. The Son is the only manifestation and revelation of the Father. There are not others. What is known of the Father is revealed through the Son. And to see the Son is to see the essence of the Father. And so the question here is, how could these disciples have been with Jesus for three plus years, listening to the Father's voice through Jesus, observing the Father's signs and wonders and miracles through Jesus, and still have the question, would you show us the Father? Jesus is like, guys, come on. You've seen the Father for three plus years. You've been right here with me. I and the Father are one. He did nothing independent from the Father. Quickly, verse 12. Truly, truly, I say to you, he that believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also, and greater works than these he will do, because I go to the Father. Jesus says, I'm going to go back to the Father. He's eventually going to tell them the Spirit is going to come, and you're going to do even greater works. Does that mean greater works in quality? No, it means greater works in quantity. Jesus was one person on the earth ministering in one particular location on the earth. He could only do so much in that one location. He is saying, as you believe in me, all of a sudden, this is going to multiply. Greater works in quantity, 
Not in quality. Oh, I'm going to go out there. Oh, Jesus raised one man. Whoa, I got a testimony. I've raised 101. Okay, whatever. That, that's not what it means. But it will be greater in quantity because the Spirit is now poured out on the earth and is poured out in the midst of God's people. Amen? And now we're going to get to, to one last wonderful truth here in those last two verses. Verses 13 and 14. Whatever you ask in my name, that will I do so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. Wow. Jesus wants to reassure these disciples they're going to see him go to the cross in less than 24 hours from this point in time. But he wants them to know he is indeed the Messiah. And he wants them to know that when they ask the Father in his name, when they go in prayer, they come in the name of Jesus. And when the answer comes, it will remind them and assure them that Jesus really is the Messiah and that he is God. He wants them to be encouraged by this. And so there is a great, great, wonderful, precious promise of God to his people. And that promise is that when we ask in Jesus name, he answers. What does it mean to ask in Jesus name? It means to be completely aware of who Jesus is, to be completely aware of what he has done for us on Calvary's cross, to be completely aware that he's capable of doing whatever his purposes are. That's what it means to ask in Jesus name. It means to understand and to recognize that when we ask, we're, we're, we're asking on behalf of him. You and I are representatives of Jesus. You and I are ambassadors for Christ. So I don't have all the tools necessary to carry out God's mission. Do you? Do you on, on your own, I'm talking. Do you have that on your own? Can you do it on your own? I can't do it on my own. We need God's help. So we come and we ask in Jesus' name, Lord, whatever I have need of today, especially to further your purpose and your cause and your desire on this earth, Lord, I'm coming, but I don't come in my name. I have nothing to come in my own name. I have to come in the name of Jesus because we act as his representative with his power and authority. It involves giving him honor and following his purposes in everything we do. And because of that, when we ask in Jesus' name, I'm going to sum it up here for you. Donald Stamps brings three great points home. Number one, when we ask in Jesus' name in our prayers, it reflects Jesus' character, and it must be consistent with his desires and his purposes. When we pray and we pray in his name, it better reflect his character. It better reflect his purposes and his plans and not my own. Amen? Number two, we must demonstrate faith in him and in his authority. When we come in his name, I'm saying, no, it's not me. I can't do it, God, but I'm coming in Jesus' name because I know he has all authority and he has the power to do it. Number three, it reveals a sincere desire to honor both the Father and the Son. And so prayers that are offered with this attitude and awareness will build faith and provide peace that God's in control and will do what he knows is best for us. And I love this comment. This is great. Jesus will answer any prayer that he would have prayed himself. Jesus will answer any prayer if it's one he would have prayed for himself. Jesus, please give me that big jet airliner. Well, what, did, he, did he demonstrate that when he was on the earth, that that was a necessary thing for him? No. So maybe not on that, okay? We need to be aware of that. Anything that lines up perfectly with his purposes, those prayers he will answer. In fact, there's no limit to the power of prayer when it is addressed to Jesus, to the Father, in sincere faith and according to God's desire and his plans. No limit to that at all. Sister Ann, if you would come. Jesus' personal message, the fourth one for you. Ask anything in my name. Are you a praying person? Do you really believe God when you come to him? Do you cry out to him? Are you the kneeling Christian? Are you a Christian whose life is characterized by prayer? Remember how we began? Don't let your hearts be troubled. Come to him in prayer. Ask him for his help. God is not sitting up there saying, oh boy, I hope they don't come to me because I've had it with them. <laughs> They have just, they've asked too many times. I'm worn out. I'm tired. I don't want to hear from them. That's not God. He wants us to come. The son is glorified when we come. And the father is glorified when we come in the name of the son. God himself is glorified. We come in his name. He answers the prayer. And then we say, 
To God be the glory. To God be the glory. Amen. Great things he has done. That's how we respond in this. Some beautiful personal messages and promises of the Lord to us today. Amen. Amen. So we know that he's coming back again. What a great promise that is. Amen. Amen. He says, I'm coming back again for you. And to me, I mean, we could camp out there and that would just be the, the, the greatest of all of it. I'm coming back for you. But then also he says, I'm the only way. He's let us know he's the only way. And then thirdly, he's told us, look to me if you want to see God. You want a relationship with God, you've got to look to me. And then finally and fourthly, he says, ask anything in my name. I'm going to ask you now if you would bow your heads. Moms that are here, maybe moms are here today and you say, there's something I've been praying maybe for my child or my grandchildren or maybe just something in my life. Moms, I know you do a lot of work and there's a lot on your shoulders. But right now, I encourage you, continue to pray. I I, I bet you the greatest number of people are in heaven today because they had praying moms. (laughs) Oh, the Lord answers the prayer of those mothers and those grandmothers. I'm so thankful that I had a mom that prayed for me and I'm so thankful for the moms that are here. Mom, pray, believe, God will answer. Maybe every one of us here, not just for moms, all of us here. Do you have a heavy burden today? Is your soul troubled? Pray, seek the Lord, call out to him today. Ask today, let him answer and then say to God be the glory. Heavenly Father, I I just, in the name of Jesus right now, I ask that this message will have just flowed into our hearts and into our lives today. Jesus, you're coming again. That is a great promise you've given to us. Lord, you've told us that we're to look to you because you are the only way. And you've made that very, very clear. And you've spoken that to us. You've told us if we want to see the Father, we just, we read you. We read about you, Lord, and we pray to you. In fact, we pray in your name and you will answer Anything we ask in your name, you hear us, you answer, because we understand what it means to ask in your name. I pray for every person here, minister and meet every need in this place today. Encourage, I pray there would just be a spirit of prayer, that when we leave this place, we will have been more encouraged because it's all about Jesus. Our hearts will not be troubled. We believe in God the Father, we believe in Jesus Christ, his Son. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, the three in one. Thank you, Lord, for ministering today. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Very quickly, with heads bowed and eyes closed.